Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Freeman. I'm Director of Communications for the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Now is a great time to check your audio settings. To activate closed captioning, please select the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom window. To pin the ASL interpreter, click more by their name in the participants list and click pin. To th kick things off, you can go ahead and use the chat function to share a little bit about yourself. I'm going to move into some Zoom get, um, guidelines, but before we do that, we're gonna have a little fun. Um, let us know in the chat, what is your favorite Disney movie? Go ahead and put that in there too. This chat is a space to share stories, questions, or resources. If you share a question on the chat, it will eventually be read aloud by one of the hosts. Please ask questions during the Q&A portion of the presentation so that we can keep track of them. Assume good faith from your colleagues. We are all here to learn together. Please recognize and respect others' feelings, background, and cultural differences. Everyone has a different experience and everyone's experience is important. Please use a chat or raise hand function if you wish to share verbally. To raise your hand, click on the reactions button at the bottom of the meeting screen and then click raise hand. If you are on the phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. Again, we ask you that you wait until the Q&A portion of the meeting to do so. If you are speaking, please speak slowly as we have ASL and closed captioners working with us today and try to limit yourself to 30 seconds or less. And can, it can be just as courageous to listen as it is to share. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate and recognize Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. I am Elizabeth Jeffrey Franco, Communications Director for the University of Arizona Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities, and I'm a white woman with blue eyes and light brown hair combed back into a bun today. I'm proud to be part of a team collaborating to highlight the need for broader acceptance and inclusion of people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities across the state. Our team, the Arizona DD Network, includes the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, the Arizona Center for Disability Law, the University of Arizona Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities, and the Institute for Human Development at Northern Arizona University. It also includes the Arizona Association of People Supporting Employment First Chapter and Arizona Vocational Rehabilitation. The theme for this year's Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month is beyond the conversation. It's not just talking, it's about action. We've designed a series of webinars to share personal stories and videos, complemented by robust social media campaigns on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Indeed, our work on DD awareness is not confined to just one month, rather it continues each day. Today, we are delighted to feature a leader with a deep understanding of disability issues who makes it a point to share her positive messages with individuals and families. She has dedicated her career to helping individuals shift from seeing disability as something you have to seeing disability as a part of who you are. Dr. Gabrielle Fici identifies as a woman with a disability. She is a licensed therapist and a certified rehabilitation counselor. Dr. Fici has a decade of teaching and counseling experience. She is the CEO and therapist at her therapy practice, New Perspectives, LLC. She is working to bring mental health services to the disabled community and their families. She also works as a professor in both counseling and disability studies, currently holding a full-time faculty position at the University of Phoenix. Her specialty and research areas focus on disability pride, both for individuals and families, independent living, resilience, and disability identity. She also works as a consultant and advocates for families on disability issues to help raise awareness about bettering the lives of individuals with disabilities in our community. Her passion is to advocate for equality and justice for the disabled community. When Dr. Fici isn't busy teaching and running her own therapy practice, she spends her time serving her community. 
She's on the board at Easter Seals Blake Foundation and Care for the Caregivers. In her own words, Dr. Fici says, quote, I want to help families see the disability can be embraced and valued, not just by the person with the disability, but by everyone within the system, because I truly believe that to love someone means fully accept accepting them for who they are. Finally, I just want to mention that at the end of the webinar today, we will be distributing a brief survey. So please take a few moments to complete the survey and share your thoughts when the time comes. Now let's hear from Dr. Gabrielle Fici on making the shift, seeing disability as something you have, to seeing disability as a part of who you are. Dr. Fici. Hello, thank you for such a nice introduction. That was great. I'm so excited to see all of you here and it's nice to see some familiar faces. So hi and some new ones. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and pull up my PowerPoint. But before I do that, I just want to kind of set the stage that this can be a conversation and I hope this is a conversation. So if you have questions, or comments, I welcome and encourage them uh, so we can talk about all of these concepts together. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint. We can get started. Can everybody see the screen okay? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Got some yeses in the chat too, so it looks like we are good to go. So before I dive into how we're framing disability and how to make this shift that I think is so important. The first thing I wanted to do is set a disability framework for the conversation. So to do that, I'll first mention for anybody that doesn't know me or can't tell in the camera, I am a wheelchair user who was born with my disability. So I identify as a disabled woman myself. Um, and I'm also wearing a pink sweater with my hair in a ponytail and glasses today. So first, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about impairment versus disability, because I think we use these three words on my screen pretty interchangeably at different points. So I wanted to highlight the differences. So when we're talking about an impairment, what we're looking at there is the biological or physiological condition that entails either a physical, sensory, cognitive, or emotional loss in some way. So the impairment is what results from the diagnosis you get from a doctor, which is how we traditionally view disability a lot of the time. So I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about how we can make that shift. So when we look at the disability itself, we're looking at the loss or limitation of opportunity to take part in society on an equal level with others due to social and emotional barriers. So the disability results from society and lack of accommodation, lack of inclusivity, because an individual has an impairment. And then what we traditionally refer to as a handicap, and I'll get into why we've really gotten away from using this word um, a little bit later, but that's where we look at a disadvantage resulting from an impairment or a disability is how Society generally uses that term. And so this is where we really start to make the shift to 
disability being a social construct. What I mean when I say that is the disability results from society and how we're viewed within our collective. Um, and a lot of the oppression that dis disabled individuals face comes from that lack of access, inclusion, and disability pride and culture, which we will get into in just a little bit. So there are different models of disability that kind of outline the points I was making a little bit earlier. So I wanted to make sure we all had a basic understanding of this before I start talking about which model of disability I subscribe to as an individual who's really learned to embrace her identity. So on one side, we have the medical model of disability. And traditionally, out of this model, disability is viewed as a medical problem that needs to be fixed or cured. So when we're looking at disability out of a lens of cure, we are doing it from the medical model. The medical model places the responsibility and the burden on the person with the disability to fix themselves or to adapt. And this is really traditionally how we've looked at disability in our society in a lot of ways. And I think making a shift to the social model of disability really helps to reframe how we see that as a collective. So the social model of disability, on the other hand, sees disability as a social construction that comes from barriers and inaccessible environments. So this is the idea that the disability is created from the environment and society in which we live. If everything was universally designed and accessible to everyone across the board, we wouldn't have the conversations around disability we have now. So the social model puts that responsibility on society as a whole to adapt to individuals' needs rather than the individual having to, to be the one that adapts. And then to go off of that is the minority group model. And this really recognizes that people with disabilities are oppressed and discriminated against on a systemic level, right? The systems in our country, in our society, in our world, are not set up for people with disabilities to be fully included and participating members of our society. We're still seen as an other in a lot of places. And we'll get into what we can do about this in a little bit. I'm not here to outline the problem and then leave you all hanging, but I wanted to make sure that we had an understanding of the perspective that I was coming from. So then, based on the model of disability, what we really face as far as disability discrimination is called ableism. So what do I mean when I say ableism? This is the discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the belief that typical abilities are superior. So non-disabled individuals are superior to those with disabilities. At its heart, ableism is rooted in the assumption that the disabled people require fixing. So it goes back to that medical model way of thinking. And then like racism or sexism, ableism classifies entire groups of people as less than and can attribute harmful stereotypes or misconceptions that generalize people with disabilities in our community. So this is the idea that the things we are participating in on a daily basis and the messages either we receive as disabled individuals or are being put out about the disability community place disabled individuals as inferior 
to people that are not. I think one of the biggest barriers to combating ableism in our society is that a lot of people, even within our own community, are not aware of ableism. They're not aware of what ableism looks like. And then we're not in the position to confront it or call it out ourselves because we haven't been made aware. So I wanted to add some examples. Um, and if please, if you've experienced any of these yourself or you have additional examples to add, I would encourage you to put those in the chat and put your experiences in the chat um, so we can make this a little bit of a discussion. But some examples of ableism that I've come across and that I know are common, um, lack of compliance with disability rights laws like the ADA. Uh, we are still in a system where so many people, even though we've had the ADA since 1990, uh, so many people aren't aware of what's required of them under the law. Um, business owners and different, different uh, systems that we have to interact with every day don't even know what they're supposed to do. <laughs> um, let alone how that should look in day to day. Um, segregating students with disabilities in separate schools. Um, using restraint as a means of controlling students with disabilities. Uh, segregating adults and children with disabilities. So and when I say segregating, this example gives institutions, but we see segregation so often. Uh, and it's the idea that there's a separate um, activity or place for individuals with disabilities away from everybody else, right? And so making them an other. Um, failing to incorporate accessibility into building design plans. A uh, quick example of that one, um, when, when we did um, ADAPT in Arizona, we were bringing awareness to some new businesses that had opened and were not accessible. And that was when I learned that our building code did not match the ADA, which means that these businesses could obtain their certificate of occupancy because they met building code even if they weren't up to ADA standards. Dr. Fiji? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but we, we had a question about that in the, in the chat I wanted to draw your attention to. Betty is asking, so who do you report these issues to? I have a doctor's office I regularly go to that has no accessibility features. Uh, these are offices frequented by people with mobility disabilities. Who do we tell? Sure, yeah. So I would definitely make complaints with the Department of De Department of Justice, so the DOJ. Um, I know Arizona Center for Disability Law is on the call, and and they could help you with that as well. But that's a that's a great question because we definitely want to raise more awareness about when people are not meeting the requirements of the ADA. So thank you for that question. Um, then we have things like building inaccessible websites. I mean, everything happens on the internet now and the amount of websites that are not fully accessible to individuals that need things like screen readers and different accessibility functions to access them is, the number is growing. Um, using disability as a punchline or mocking people with disabilities refusing to provide reasonable accommodations. And that's a really good example of why it's so important to be aware of your rights as a disabled person, because there are people still that will refuse. They don't think they have to, and they don't think there are laws or repercussions in place when in fact there are. Um, 
And then the eugenics movement of the early 1900s is one of our earlier examples of ableism, which basically is a representation of how if you were born with a disability, you were automatically viewed as less than, um, and your life was not as valued uh, as your non-disabled peers. So these are just some examples to be aware of. Like I said, I encourage you guys to share your own examples in the chat. If you have experiences with ableism, um, it's important to have these conversations and talk about where we are and where we want to go. Okay. So now we're going to get into disability pride. So this will be the shift from that, right? I, I'm talking about where we were and the framework that we, a lot of us as a society are operating in and how we want to shift that to disability being something that people are, are proud to be a part of this community. And just before I jump into this, I will say that this shift took me as a person a really long time. It was not until I was introduced to my community um, and more individuals with disabilities and put in environments and situations where I could truly embrace who I was and what my disability brought to my life that I myself was able to make this shift. So I'm going to give us some frameworks and examples today on how we can do this. But I also want to mention that it's important to recognize that it's a process. There we go. So just some broad examples first. So we can get an idea. People with disabilities consist of the nation's largest minority group. And we are the only, what I refer to as equal opportunity minority group, right? And what I mean by that is you can become a part of the disability community at any time. You can be born with your disability like myself, you can acquire your disability at any point in life, or you can age into having a disability. So we intersect with every other minority group represented. There are 95 million children ages 0 to 14 that have a disability. And children with disabilities and any individuals with disabilities really, really need to understand that we can really generate a sense of belonging and pride within our community. I think sometimes this experience can feel very isolating, which is why I like to share these numbers and these statistics, because really there are a lot of us. There are more of us than anyone else. So there is a very large community of people here for you. I think one of the caveats to that that all of us should be aware of is that sometimes we really can get stuck in what I call silos of disability, which means we segregate activities based on, you know, diagnosis a lot of the time. So whether it's a family who has a child with a disability or you as the disabled individual yourself, um, oftentimes we seek out people who have the same diagnosis or will go to activities or events or organizations that promote a specific disability. And I think that can sometimes add to the isolation because we're not seeing disability as a collective, right? We are, in fact, an entire group of people that doesn't have to have the same diagnosis in order to relate to one another in our experiences. So what do I mean when I say disability culture? Disability culture is the idea 
that people with disabilities have forged a group identity. We share a common history of oppression. We've all grown up in that idealism of disability. We've all experienced oppression, and it's given us a common bond of resilience. Disabled individuals generate art, music, literature, and other expressions of our life and our culture, and it's infused from the disability experience. And I think that's a really important thing to highlight is that when we think of culture, oftentimes we're looking at our backgrounds and our ethnicities. And if you think about that for a second, they all come with their own customs and their own expressions of life and disability is no different. We are proud of ourselves as people with disabilities and we're really working to claim our disabilities with pride as part of our identity. We are who we are, right? There is no amount of therapy. There's no amount of interventions. There's no amount of medication that is going to take me from being a disabled woman to not being a disabled woman, right? But I think sometimes we get stuck in this idea of seeing disability as a diagnosis. And then that's where we can get stuck in that medical model. Whereas if it's a part of us and it's a part of our identity that we are given the opportunity to embrace, that's when we really get to see all that this experience has to offer. Dr. Fici, we actually have another question in the chat. It says, I remember a few years ago that you led a protest on a restaurant by the U of A because they were not accessible. They refused to comply. What was the outcome of that protest? Oh, yes, we did. That was, uh, we led a protest at Illegal Peace in Tucson, for anybody that's familiar. Um, and they had, just to give everybody a little bit of background, they had done all new construction to turn that building into a restaurant. And even after their new construction, it was not fully accessible. Um, and so the outcome of that protest, that protest is actually where I learned that our building code does in fact not match the ADA. Um, so the outcome of that protest was that we met with and continued meeting with um, the city of Tucson and pressuring them to make those changes. We did not leave the restaurant without a commitment to start that process. Um, and we were able to get a lot of accessibility features uh, that they were missing, which was, which was great, but it wouldn't have happened without the awareness and it wouldn't have happened without drawing people's attention to the discrimination. And I think so often that's where we get stuck in doing this is that when we go to places like that restaurant that are not doing, in fact, what they are federally mandated to do, a lot of us are taught that we are supposed to take what we can get as disabled individuals. So rather than filing a complaint and going through the motions, it's like, well, I couldn't use the bathroom, but at least they had a ramp, right? So, so I probably shouldn't ruffle any feathers. I am here to tell you that you should ruffle the feathers, right? We have to assume that other people are not saying anything either, or we wouldn't be going into a situation like that because somebody would have already said something to fix it. And for myself and for the people coming after me, I want it to be fixed. Right? We've got to ruffle some feathers. We've got to draw more attention to the fact that these things that are actually federally mandated are not happening on a regular basis. So how can we do some of these things 
Uh, I think a lot of what we have to look for is disability empowerment. So families and disabled individuals need to find the most effective ways to navigate the disability experience. Each person deserves respect, they deserve dignity, and they deserve independence and self-pride. This starts as an individual journey that you are supported on by your community. But I think so often when we open up the conversation of disability, it doesn't include conversations like independence or self-pride. Because sometimes growing up with a disability can make these things more difficult to achieve. Unfortunately, I think that means that the collective ideas and decision-making then becomes, well, if it's going to be harder, then we don't have to, right? We shouldn't. Um, and I think to really start embracing disability means turning that idea on its head and saying, if fighting for that respect, that dignity, and that independence is a little bit harder at first, it's worth the effort for the outcome. And I think so often, because the disability experience is difficult, it can feel like a lot to put in that effort. So I wanted to touch really quickly on the importance of language because I think how we frame disability really speaks to being able to embrace disability pride. So I think how we talk about it and the words we use are actually very important because they all convey different messages about disability. So these are just some examples. This is in no way an exhaustive list, but it definitely starts the conversation. This is usually where people have some questions. So I'm an open book. If any of this doesn't make sense or you want to talk about what that might look like, feel free to put that in the chat. But we're really, so I'll just go through each example and give a little bit of background. Things like differently abled, special or special needs and gifted. These are what we call euphemisms to describe disability. They are all a way to avoid saying the word disabled. When we can't say the word disabled, how are we supposed to embrace disability? We are, in fact, disabled. You've heard me refer to myself as a disabled woman several times already today. That's because I choose to identify myself that way. I'm sure we're all familiar with person first language, which puts the disability first. That's the first example there. And then identity first language puts the identity first. But both of those really encourage saying the word disabled or disability instead of the euphemism that goes with it. And my special caveat, if you will, about special needs, pun intended, is that our needs themselves are not special. They are needs like everybody else. Everybody has needs. And so as a disabled person, to make those needs special is to categorize them as an other, when really I'm just a person that has specific needs just like any other person that has specific needs, and I'm a disabled individual. So our needs aren't special, and as long as we continue to classify them that way, we're sending the wrong message. Handicap or handicapped. Instead, we want to use person with a disability or disabled person, and we want to use accessible as the adjective. For anybody on this call that doesn't know, the origin of this word came from the Depression in the 20s when people used their caps to beg for money, and it became their handicap. So, I, for one, prefer not to have that association. Uh, and also, when we say things like handicap parking, for example, the parking space is not handicap, actually. The parking space is fine. So actually, how what we're trying to say is that space is accessible for us to use. 
Uh, wheelchair bound is another really big one. We are not stuck in them. We use wheelchairs as a way to get around and as a way to fully participate in our society. Personally, I love my wheelchair. Her name is Stella. It is because of her that I can get around and do lots of things. And she opened up a whole new world for me. So instead of wheelchair bound, I'm a wheelchair user or a person who uses a wheelchair. Also, like we don't sleep in them. I don't know where that notion came from, but again, not stuck. Um, victim, uh, disabled people aren't victims. And that again, perpetuates the message that disability is bad. Uh, instead of slow, delayed, or cognitively challenged, we would refer to that as an intellectual disability, again, using the word. And then instead of normal, able-bodied, or typical, because those phrases can lead to ableist remarks, again, putting uh, non-disability superior to disability, we say that that person is non-disabled. So the next thing I'm going to talk about today is independent living. And this perspective, for anybody that's not familiar, really encapsulates everything I'm talking about today and really is what helped me on my journey to start to embrace my disability. All came from the independent living perspective. So what is the independent living movement? Independent living is a philosophy and a movement by and for people with disabilities that really focuses on empowerment, uh, self-determination, freedom of choice, having control over your everyday life as a disabled person, as expected by anybody else. Independent living means that we have the same choices and control in our everyday lives that non-disabled people do. And it also views the disabled person as the expert. We are the experts in our own experience, in our own needs, and what our day-to-day -day looks like. But so often, disabled individuals are put into situations where a team of people or very well-meaning supporters are the ones really making those choices and decisions. So this reframes that to say, even if you need support, you as the disabled person can still be involved and still be the expert. Just for a little bit of background, Ed Roberts is who we refer to as the father of independent living. He opened his first sill in 1972. And these are some quotes I really like from him that outline the experience. It says, the greatest lesson of the civil rights movement is that the moment you let others speak for you, you lose, right? I realize that disability is actually a strength and disability can be very powerful. I think what he hits on there when he says the moment you let others speak for you, you lose, is that individuals outside of this experience can never fully understand this experience. They are not living your life, right? So we should always look for opportunities to have that input on choices that affect us. And he's absolutely right. Disability can be very powerful. As a collective, I think we are more adaptable. We are resilient. We understand what it is to do things outside of the box. Those are all strengths that can be used and pulled on to do so many different things in our life. And she's not pictured here, but I think we should quickly touch on Judy Human, 
who unfortunately we lost a few weeks ago. If he's the father of independent living, she was kind of the mother um, of disability rights. And what I really like um, from her quotes is that she emphasized that to be independent, even if you can't physically do things for yourself necessarily, you can still be in control of how they're done. Heather says her book is incredible. I wholeheartedly agree. If you have not read it, totally recommend. She's great. Uh, this is an overview of the independent living principles for anybody that's not familiar. We have my favorite one there at the top, dignity of risk, which is the right to take a risk and make decisions and mistakes just like everyone else. This one's my favorite for a couple of reasons. I think so often individuals with disabilities are sheltered away from taking risks, but taking risks and failures are how we learn. And it's what makes all the other stuff worth it. <laughs> so taking that away from the disabled individual is taking away that agency. Uh, I think we all have the right to try and fail and try again. And the other side to that coin is, if we try and we succeed, we should be able to take responsibility for that success. It should be ours. And if it's the success of the 10 people that told us to do it, we don't get to be in full ownership of that success. Uh, informed choice is the next one. So this is being informed of all of your options and then having the right to make the decision. So instead of these are your options, but we think this is the one that's best for you, is these are your options. Which one do you want to pick? What is your decision? Consumer control looks at having the power, authority, and responsibility of your own life. So again, being the one in that driver's seat. Community integration. So this is the ability to live and participate fully in all aspects of our community. And I think that one goes off of advocacy pretty well, which is the last one. And when we talk about advocacy, I think it's important to highlight that we need both awareness and action to make change. I think it's one thing to be aware of these issues. And by coming here today, you're all increasing your awareness, which is great. But to really make those changes, we need to take action and advocate. Uh, one recent example of that and some of the lovely individuals on this call were there with me. We just went and had a meeting um, with a Senator, Senator Wadsack, who was introducing a bill, it was 1411, that would make it so that anyone within the DDV system would automatically have a guardian when they turned 18, which takes away the right to due process if someone is going to take over guardianship for you. First, she amended the bill to say, okay, I'll take out the automatic, but I still think the responsibility should be with DDD and not the court system. Well, again, disabled people have the right to due process when deciding who has control over their own lives, right? And so we all went and had a meeting with her and advocated to share our opposition to the bill and why. And we were able to get her to see things from our point of view. Um, but without that 
awareness plus the action, we would have passed a bill that was very detrimental to our community. And then how do we apply what I'm talking about here to everyday life? What does that look like? I think one of the key points to hit on here when we look at applying all of this and really embracing disability pride is looking at assistance versus independence. So when an individual has a disability, things can be more difficult to do or you may need help with some things. So it can be a struggle between how much do I either push my child or do I push as the individual? Uh, do I push myself to a point where this is too difficult? Do I ask for assistance? And I think the answer to that is we don't want to lower expectations just because an individual has a disability, right? Individuals with disabilities have the right to push for and achieve the same things as their non-disabled peers. It doesn't mean they can't have help doing it, but when those expectations are automatically lowered, we don't know what that individual may have been capable of achieving because we didn't let them try. So some main points when we're looking at helping to empower disabled individuals. I've talked about this one throughout the presentation, but it's important to see individuals with disabilities and see the disability as more than just a diagnosis. This next one where it says happiness with a disability versus without. This one is something that I try to draw everybody's attention to because I think a lot of us can fall into this trap either as a person with a disability or supporting the person with a disability. We have a tendency to redefine happiness when we're talking about disabled individuals. So what do I mean by that? When we look at what makes a person happy on a general scale, we're looking at a job they like. We're looking at fulfilling relationships, both friendships and romantic relationships. We're looking at living where they want to. We're looking at having a passion and a desire for certain things. We're looking at engaging with your community and friends. We're looking at sometimes going out and making some bad choices. We're looking at how we want that life to look in general. Maybe it's having children. Maybe it's getting married. Maybe it's climbing the corporate ladder. Whatever it is for you that makes you happy. And then all of a sudden, when we look at happiness and disability, we subconsciously change that definition of happiness to being content. Are they okay? Do they have their basic needs met? Do they have a smile on their face? Right? So we really need to challenge ourselves to say, are we looking at true happiness? Because every individual deserves that. And then the expectations, which I touched on a little bit, try. Don't subconsciously lower expectations just because there's a disability diagnosis. You don't know what you're going to succeed at until you try. And they deserve the chance to try just like everybody else. And then I'll reiterate the dignity of risk because I think risk is where we get the courage to try those things. If it's not okay to take a risk, it can be really scary to try. But if we look at taking a risk as an opportunity to learn and grow, then all of a sudden trying seems more doable.
And then resources, what does that look like? Seek education and emotional support. One of the reasons why I opened my therapy practice as a disabled individual is because individuals with disabilities did not have adequate mental health support and neither did their parents or their families because this experience affects the whole unit, right? So you should be able to talk to people that understand. Learn from the disability community. Disabled people are the experts. And I think for any professionals joining me on this call today, one of the ways to really embrace disability culture and pride is to make sure that disability organizations have disabled people in leadership. One of our favorite sayings in independent living is nothing about us without us, right? If you serve the disability community, the people at the forefront of that mission should be the disabled people themselves. And then help your child or friend or whatever your connection is to the disability community to really embrace the experience. Challenge ourselves to get out of that cure mindset of fixing and wanting the individual to just adapt to their environment and start to ask how environments can be adapted to them and how we can send the message that they are okay exactly as they are instead of sending continued messages that they need to change because they're disabled. And then I will just end with embracing disability is the key to promoting independence. And we all deserve that. And so to really embrace this experience means that people are given the opportunity to try and create the lives for themselves that they want. And I really think that that's how we make the shift from it just being a diagnosis to being a part of us and a part of us that we can be proud of. And with that, any questions or discussion, I'm happy to answer. We've got some time left. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see some of you. And it looks like they put the survey for the webinar and the chat too. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fici. Everyone, if you could please click into that survey and complete it before you leave today, that would be a huge help. We really rely on your feedback to um, improve these sessions moving forward. Any questions? Yes, I agree, Karen. Amazing presentation, Dr. Fici. Oh, thank you so much. How to address happiness with our children when they have missed so much because of their disability? That is a really good question. I think my first answer to that or inclination towards that would be, where can we give them the pieces of things you think they've missed, right? Just because something has to look different if you have a disability, doesn't mean we have to miss out on the whole experience. And then the other piece to that is, especially as a child, what really shifted that for me was meeting dis other disabled people. Um, and knowing that I wasn't alone in the experience, and then we could have those experiences together. Looks like we have a, a few more questions in the chat. Um, we have one from Kim. She says, I have a young adult who has autism and she's afraid to try anything because she's afraid of failure. Do you have any suggestions? I think in that instance, I would start the conversation around what about failure is scary, right? So we can address it from her feelings and her point of view 
and maybe start to normalize the experience of failure and how can you do that for her i think we need to have conversations around our failures and help her realize how common they actually are is there uh, an average age of individuals that you meet with um, my practice right now uh, starts with individuals at age 15, and then it's 15 and up because I work with a lot of parents as well. Great. Thank you. And um, we have a question from Betty. I think we might have missed this one earlier. As a transition specialist, I've dealt with parents who didn't want me to use the word disability because they didn't let their child know they had one. How do you feel about that? Or how do you deal with that, rather? Oh, Betty, we could have a whole other webinar on this conversation. Um, so how I've chosen to deal with that, and I recognize that it might be a little bit easier for me to do this as a disabled person, but how I've chosen to deal with that is, wouldn't you rather that information come from you than her start to figure it out in a society that doesn't fully accept her for who she is? because that's a very jarring experience. So if you are the one that can start to have those conversations and present disability in a more positive light, we should take advantage of that opportunity. And then I can offer to help them do that. And we have a comment here. Thank you, Dr. Fici. I love what you shared today. How can we help make this information more common knowledge? That's a great question um, because that is something I've I've dedicated my career to at this point. And I think um, I'm still trying to answer that question for myself. But one of the things I've noticed that really helps is amplifying disabled voices um, and counteracting the narrative that disability is negative. I think you touched on this a bit, but we have a question from Aubrey. Uh, do you have any tips with working with families that do not give their loved ones a voice? Some of the members that I work with are not given a voice or choices. And when I involve the member, families shut the members down. Yeah, no, that, that's a very difficult experience. I think with those individuals, something that's really helped me is to frame it for them as if that was their experience. Right, like a lot of them don't realize that they're doing it. <laughs> um, and so if I say something like, you know, if we were all having a conversation about you around this table, like how would you want us to respond? Um, and wouldn't you want to be able to give your input? Because your son, daughter, whoever deserves that same opportunity. And do you mind reminding us what the name of that bill is that would assign guardianship for individuals with disabilities turning 18? Sure, it's SB 1411. Amazing. I see a comment in the chat that says, Dating, having friends is something missed. Um, I will acknowledge that that can be more difficult as a disabled person. Um, and as someone who's, you know, been in a long-term partnership now, uh, I've been with my partner for going, we're going on 11 years. Um, I think what really helped sort of break that ceiling for me was finding my community. All of a sudden it was like, oh, I get to be myself in this space. And then myself attracts the people that I want to spend time with. And then by extension attracted the people I was attracted to. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think community is super important. A question there from Jalisa. My son refuses to use tools that give him accessibility, specifically in the classroom. 
how can I promote this? Or is this a situation where dignity of risk applies? That's a really good question. Um, I think my first inclination is that dignity of risk applies because he needs to figure out for himself that there are, you know, as long as he's presented again with the options. So if you're presenting him with the options of ways to make things easier and he's choosing not to use them, at that point, that that's his choice. My only caveat to that would be, what's the reason he's not using them? Because if it's to appear less disabled, then that's where we need to have the conversation about embracing who you are, which could be a difficult conversation to start, but I think it's important. And our families, as long as we help them do that, are the safest place to start that conversation. Michael is wondering if you provide counseling services to Spanish-speaking families. I have one individual right now who I do use an interpreter with, um, but I myself am not Spanish-speaking in full disclosure, but yeah. Wonderful. Well, it looks like questions are dying down. This was a, an amazing presentation, lots of interaction from the group. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And again, I just want to put in one final plug. Please do fill out that survey if you have a moment. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's a lot of fun. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.